So good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Let's get a little applause going for Dr. Bob Murphy. Um, you know, I would like to say that I personally have really enjoyed this lecture. I consider it one of the more important and engaging lectures of the week because uh, I'm actually quite proud of the fact that the Mises Institute is a place where we can at least consider or explore or, or maybe even advocate uh, the concept of a truly stateless society, one where even uh, supposedly public goods were national defense, so-called, where streets and roads and police even and, uh, and judicial services are provided privately. And of course, this is an, an esoteric topic in that sense. Uh, but nonetheless, I think it's one that's important and one that we need to consider seriously. So I'm, I'm glad that you all made it to this plenary. Uh, but it, you know, earlier in the week, I mentioned that the, the relationships that people have made over the years, the connections are as important as the ideas themselves, because that's how ideas are transmitted through actual human beings. And uh, so we would be remiss if we did not mention that uh, our great friend and, and senior fellow, Dr. Bob Murphy, uh, recently wed his girlfriend, Kellyanne, and we just wanted to congratulate him. Um, we have a... Uh, we have... <laughs> it's not... Uh, it's not, uh, it's not a set of matching his and her towels from Kmart or anything like that. I don't know. Uh, but, but, you know, we just wanted to congratulate them, and we wanted to say how pleased we are uh, for them, and that, uh, you know, on behalf of the Mises Institute and everyone here, how much we love them and care for them, and uh, wish them many, many happy years. So congratulations, Bob. Thank, thank you so much, Jeff uh, and everybody. Uh, I'm pretty sure that that's a copy of Human Action in there. But uh, <laughs> all right, well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks for showing up, everybody. And as Jeff said, this is a fun one. Let me just clarify. Um, so I'm going to be going over lots of different topics in this one pretty quickly, uh, breezing through. If, however, the issue of military defense, that's such a thorny issue and that there's so many you know, conceptual hurdles there that that's going to be, if you're, if you're interested in that, I'll be covering that tomorrow in a, in a separate lecture. Last housekeeping notice, um, as far as private law, like police and judicial services, the single lecture you want to go to for that, it's called the Market for Security that I've given at previous uh, Mises U's, and so that's the one you want to look up for that as well. So without further ado, let's jump into this talk. So just to set the, the stage for this, I'd like to open with this quote. I'll read it for those in the back. For if the bulk of the public were really convinced of the illegitimacy of the state, if it were convinced that the state is nothing more nor less than a bandit gang writ large, then the state would soon collapse to take on no more status or breadth of existence than another mafia gang. Hence the necessity of the state's employment of ideologists, and hence the necessity of the state's age-old alliance with the court intellectuals who weave the apologia for state rule. Okay, and so that's kind of the context and, and partly what, I guess, our mission is for those of us who lecture at Mises University is just educational to, to just show people once you see things in this fashion, it's pretty obvious what, you know, what, the, what the conclusion would be. And I believe it or not, uh, some people might recognize this quote, but it actually comes from Christina Romer. If you, yeah, when she was younger, she was pretty, guys, come on. It's Murray Rothbard, give me a break. All right, and see, if you believe me for even half a second there, that's the problem, okay? <laughs> you can't just, just the guy's up here in a coat telling you stuff, no, 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 you gotta think for yourself. Well, you should trust no one, all right. <laughs> it's your fault the state still exists, okay. <laughs> all right, and so I'm gonna obviously jump into specifics here, but let me just also, in terms of the general outline, Whenever you encounter a problem like this, because the typical pattern is that there's some difficult social issue, you know, people are being harmed or, or their prosperity is being shackled by some thing going on, and then unfortunately most people immediately rush to, oh, well, the state can do something about it, right? And that's the first thing that people go to. But what I want you just to remind you of is that if everyone knows that a certain voluntary arrangement would, quote, lead to dis disaster in some area, then that means there's a huge opportunity for an entrepreneur to come in and fix it, okay? And so with all this stuff, it's, it's odd. It's like there's this market failure and everybody on the planet can totally see what the problem is and knows the obvious fix, 
except the people who would make billions of dollars from doing it. They're assumed to not know how to fix it, and they're just going to keep, see, well, well, you know, it's free market, can't do anything about it. In particular, the way this manifests itself when it comes to economic models of what's called market failure is that they have a very narrow set of strategies, let's say, to use that technical jargon, that the, the firm can engage in. So just to give a simple example of what I mean, um, something there was this, this problem that economists deal with where what if marginal cost doesn't begin rising at some point? So, you know, certain applications like air travel, things like that, where once you're going to build a plane and have you know, two, two seats available, then to add more and more passengers, the marginal cost of the airline is pretty low. And yet, if the airline merely charged, you know, the, that every customer what it costs to just add one more person to the flight, well, then it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work out, right? The airline would be losing money if they charged every customer the marginal cost of the flight. And yet, they also couldn't charge the first customer the full cost, you know, that, that sort of thing that the first person can't be ended up paying a million dollars to fly somewhere, but yet to add the 37th passenger, that's a pretty low marginal cost, and yet every ticket can't cost that. So if you're familiar with mainstream economics, you know that under ideal conditions, the market is optimal, or you reach a Pareto optimum when price equals marginal cost. And if it doesn't, oh, there's monopoly power and blah, blah, blah. All right, so that's just one example of the kind of thing I mean where when you try to apply conventional economic tools to real life situations, you, it sometimes pops out that oh, the market's stuck and can't fix itself when obviously there's other pricing strategies. Another example would be something like wholesale clubs like uh, BJ's or Sam's Club, if you guys are familiar with that, where they, you buy things, large, large bulk purchases, and they charge you much lower unit costs than you'd get elsewhere. So they're not literally charging you the marginal cost to them in terms of the accounting, but it's much closer to that. And so how does that model work is they charge a large fee for you to be in the club to have the right to come into the store in the first place and then you also pay you know unit prices for the stuff you buy so that's just one example of how they partly solve this problem of oh what if marginal costs are really low for large ranges of output we can't you know reach the optimum you could say oh well instead of just charging a unit price to everybody who buys products maybe you charge a membership fee and that's how you somewhat separate it so you're you're charging for that consumer surplus, if you know that term. Okay, so that's just some examples of what I'm talking about where they sort of arbitrarily fix what it is that private business is allowed to do or charge based on, and then they conclude, oh, see, that's going to lead to a market failure, and then they have the government come in and it has much more tools at its disposal. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about money. Um, I think they probably covered a lot of this in the earlier lecture that you saw on this, but it's okay if there's some repetition here. So as Karl Menger, the founder of the Austrian school, explained money emerged on the market, and this was a tour de force of his explanation where you know, he, he walks through and shows, for example, that the so-called state theory of money doesn't really make sense. It really uh, doesn't work to say, okay, well, there was a time at which humans didn't have money, and then there's a time later when clearly they do have money. It's not a natural thing, right? It's not like trees. So clearly money somehow is related to human activity. And so the natural conclusion most people would have is there must have been some wise king or philosopher somewhere in the past that invented money and then maybe cajoled people or persuaded them or used force to get the community to start using it. And then the benefits were made manifest. And there you go. And that's, why, that's where money comes from. And so Menger had several arguments to show that that really doesn't work. So one thing is we don't have a record of such a person, right? You would think if some wise king thousands of years ago invented money, that might have been recorded, but you know, there is no such record of someone inventing money. Also, it's just the in inherent implausibility of it, that if you hadn't seen money in operation, if someone tried to explain it to you, it sounds dumb. Right, if you think about it, like okay, like imagine some king saying, "Okay, right now you guys are you're trading horses for eggs, let's say, and it makes sense why you're doing that because you use the horse for transportation and you guys eat the eggs, so you can see why you would do that." But how about here's these shells that nobody really cares about one way or the other. What if instead you sold the horse for these shells, and then someone said, well, "Why would I do that? I don't want the shells." No, don't worry, because this person with the eggs will also accept the shells. And so if you could convince everyone in the community to accept something they don't really want because everybody else is going to do the same stupid thing, trust me, if we all act stupidly in unison, we'll all, <laughs> right? It's sort of like a frat initiation ritual. But 
Um, so that's, the, you, you see how that, if you were trying to explain to someone who had never seen it before, it sounds crazy. And so Menger just goes through and he shows these problems. Even if you solve that problem, let's say the king did convince everybody in the realm, okay, from now on, every time you want to trade something, first sell it for these things that you really don't care about one way or the other, but don't worry because somebody else in turn will do likewise and reciprocate. Even if you could get everyone to agree to do that, or maybe they did it because you're saying, we'll chop your head off if I, if I catch anyone selling against things besides these shells that the king's holding up, how would you lock in the purchasing power, right? It's not enough just to say the person selling your horses, now nah, you got to do it against these shells. You don't know how much is one shell worth. You know, how many horses or how many shells should one horse fetch? In order to answer that, you would need to know, well, I kind of wanted to actually go get eggs, and so I need to know how many, you know, these shells, how, how many eggs do they command in the marketplace before I know if I want to sell my horse for shells. And so you see the problem is really difficult once you start seriously considering it. So Menger came up with a theory for the origin of money that solved all those problems or that was, you know, impervious to those objections. So real quickly, he said that, okay, even in a, I'm, I'm paraphrasing obviously, but even in a state of barter, where there's, there's no money, there's no even what's called a medium of exchange, still different goods would have different degrees of saleability or marketability or liquidity, if you know those terms. So like eggs, there's more of a market for eggs. More people would, would be willing to accept an egg on any given day than people who are in the market for like a fancy telescope. Okay, so a telescope's very valuable. If you found the right buyer, you could get a lot for it but most people on any given day are not looking to acquire a brand new telescope. So the idea is if you're going into town with a telescope that you're trying to unload, you're in a worse marketing position than someone going into town with two dozen eggs. All right, and so if you, let's say the person with a telescope ultimately wants to get horses, the chance of you finding someone with a horse who also wants a telescope that day are pretty low. And so what you'd be willing to do is anybody who wants a telescope and has a good that's more marketable than telescopes are, you might consider that as a, as a stepping stone, as an intermediate transaction be, to get rid of the telescope and get something like maybe a bunch of chickens that are closer, that you know is more marketable, that you're more likely to find someone with the thing you want who is accept, accepting chickens that day. Okay, so that's the process. That seems pretty straightforward. And yet if everyone's doing that, just think about the implications. So that means the goods that initially had a wider market just because of you know, natural preferences. Now they're, um, the, the range of people who would accept it is enhanced from that first round of just thinking through, oh, wait a minute, I would not only be willing to accept the stuff I directly want to use, but something that's more marketable than the thing I'm starting out with. Okay, so the goods that were initially the most marketable, their advantage gets amplified. And so Menger just said that process, you can imagine, would continue as people see other people doing that now the things that were more acceptable, like eggs, let's say, are even more acceptable. Even people who are you know, vegan might still accept eggs because, oh, I'm, I know a lot of people like these things. So that's what would happen, but there's, it's more than just the acceptability. Obviously, eggs wouldn't be very useful as a medium of exchange because they're so fragile. They don't last very long, even if you, you know, uh, tended to them properly. You can't cut them in half very easily, right? If something costs half an egg, that's awkward, right? And so that's why with that process in mind, things like gold and silver ultimately arose as the market's choice of money because of their, their property. So it's not that gold is money because it's easily divisible per se, that's not the definition, but the fact that gold is very easily divisible and so on, it's durable, it's homogeneous in terms of its quality that you know, an ounce of gold is an ounce of gold, unlike diamonds. Sorry, so that's why diamonds don't really work well as money because to say something costs a kilogram worth of diamonds, th th it depends what, how big the stones are, right? It's not that they're interchangeable, whereas with gold and silver, the weight, as long as it's you know, a specified quality, purity of the metal, the weight's really the only information you need to know in terms of saying how valuable is this you know, pile of, of commodity, all right? So that's how Menger explained that, that process. And so notice at no point in that explanation did it involve someone seeing the big picture and realizing, oh, if our whole community could switch over to using money, it would be a lot better. Nobody had to realize that. They each individually were just acting in their immediate self-interest. And yet, you know, so they're, they're being rational. They weren't just randomly trading stuff. 
each each transaction made sense on its own terms, but the whole thing, you know, taken together led to the emergence of money. All right, so that's um, Menger's explanation for the origin of money. And so that's what, how you could explain how a community might start accepting gold or silver, you know, a, as the money and, qu and quoting prices in it. But then there's also the emergence of coinage. And so here too, that's something that historically the private sector handled. So uh, George Selgin actually was this a while ago now, gave a great talk here at, at the Mises Institute, um, just giving the history of private coinage. All right, so again, there's, that's something that a lot of people just assume, oh, the state must have been in charge of that. No, private companies first, private mints first did this, and then the state came in and, and took it over and, you know, and shoved them out of the industry. But originally, so that, again, the, what's the function of coinage? So they're using gold already, and I've explained how that could have happened. And then the issue is, though, all right, if you go into a store and you just have a pile of you know, chunks of yellow metal, that's, that's cumbersome. That's hard to effect a transaction, especially if it's a big one, because then the merchant has to have special equipment to test to make sure that it really is gold, and you know, there's various things you can do. And so you don't want to have all the merchants being part-time chemists in your town. That slows, down, that slows down trade. So the function of coinage is to just somewhat ensure the authenticity and to show what this thing is, right? And so the, the, the private mint's function is it takes raw gold and silver, as it were, and stamps them into coin. They have like the, the ridges around the circumference so that you, the, the, the reason for that, in case you don't know, is because otherwise you could like shave off the edges of it and so the, the coin slightly shrinks and you get little, you know, shavings of gold or silver. So that's the function of having those notched edges so that it'd be obvious if someone tampered with the coin. All sorts of things like that that signify the authenticity so you know this is an ounce of gold. That's what the, so the, the private mints are not creating money. That's important to realize. All they're doing is taking the money, which is gold or silver, whatever it is, and just stamping it into a very recognizable form so that people can more comfortably trade it. Okay, what about banking? All right, so here too, uh, for those who saw my lecture on the Rothbardians versus the free bankers, this is somewhat redundant, but here I just wanna reiterate, there's distinct functions of banking. You have demand ac accounts, like, like checking accounts, and you also have time deposits or like savings accounts, things where there's genuine loans occurring. So those are distinct functions, but as far as just right now thinking about checking account balances, just you know, what, what's the reason for doing that? Well, it's for um, security and also just convenience. So people are walking around town, they have gold coins, and now I'm saying the next level, the next evolution layer on, on top of this just to enhance transactions would be commercial checking services. Okay, so instead of having to walk around with, let's say, a thousand gold coins in your pocket, that that's heavy, it's you know jing jingling around, you, you basically have a bullseye on your back if you're doing that, and so it'd be much safer to you go to this company called a bank and you give them your thousand gold coins, they put it in a secure vault, and then they give you paper notes, which are just easier to walk around with, easier to conceal, or they give you a checkbook or in modern times, obviously, they give, you, know, you have a debit card, and so there, the bank is just safe keeping your money, and it's just easier for you then to spend it however you want, okay? So there, again, it's pretty straightforward, and we have both theory and history to show how this can emerge um, in the absence of the state. And in fact, central banks, in practice, they do the opposite of what the public thinks, all right? So the standard story of, that the public hears as to why do we need a so-called central bank is to say, oh, well, we, you know, go look at history. That when we had unregulated private wildcat banks, they would just start up, they would issue notes that were claims on gold or silver, and then, you know, the public wouldn't know any different, so they'd accept all these different notes from fly-by-night organizations. There'd be wild currency movements, there'd be depressions, financial panics, and so the point of having a central bank was to ensure the integrity of the, of the money and also to smooth out the business cycle. All right, so both of those claims are just empirically demonstrably false, right? That obviously the, the soundness of the money, if, you, if by that we mean the purchasing power of it, clearly you know, has steadily declined with the advent of modern central banking. And even using conventional measures, bi the, the business cycle was worse with the Fed than before the Fed. And what's funny is the way sometimes um, apologists for the Fed try to 
compare and show the relative stability, they'll start in the post-war era, right? They'll, sh they'll assume that, oh yeah, what we mean by the Federal Reserve era is 1946 onward. You, you see how that's a convenient omission, all right? And sort of like the, the Great Depression's a mulligan. Just say, okay, yeah, well, they were just getting, you know, getting their ducks in a row, but now that, you know, <laughs> they started a new job, okay, they learned where the water cooler is, okay, now no more depressions, go. And then, and then after the financial crisis hit, which you know, by all measures is, was the second worst crisis to hit you know, in US history, it was not to then say, geez, that's kind of awkward that the first and second worst crises to hit occurred when the central bank was allegedly smoothing out the volatile free market business cycle. No, instead, they were just, they, how did they spin that? They said, well, look at the financial crisis in 2008, 2009 was not as bad as the Great Depression, so good thing we had the Fed there. Right, and so, because they're saying, you, you, think about it, how perverse that is. They're saying, good thing the Fed was there because otherwise the economy couldn't have gotten, or might have gotten as bad as before when the Fed was also there. <laughs> All right, so it's an, it's an odd um, juxtaposition. But in any event, also, even just on its own terms, uh, again, some of this is redundant, so I'll try to speed it up here, but the point of central banking, one, one of the functions that they'll say you know, not critics putting words in their mouth, but them proudly declaring is the central bank's a lender of last resort. And so to the, if you endorse Mises' theory of what causes the boom-bust cycle, you don't want private banks, you know, getting the go-ahead to go ahead and expand credit. And don't worry, if you get caught with your pants down, the central bank will come in and provide liquidity. No, that gives banks the incentive and the, the motivation to do what causes the business cycle. Okay, another one, fun one. Who would build the roads? <laughs> All right, so here, uh, as with a lot of this stuff, the early turnpikes, in fact, were privately financed, at least in the United States, and only later did the government get involved. And some of this stuff was funny. Like, there, I've seen um, Alex Tabarrok and some co-author or some co-editors, I'm going to forget their names, has a book, I think it's called The Voluntary City, and he has an, they have an essay in there, I forget who the author is, on private roads, and they have some examples to show, like, how did they finance them. So merchants in a town would realize, oh, if we you know, pay and, and, and get the funding for a turnpike to come through here, that will boost business. So some of the big merchants would all hit each other up and say, let's kick in and do this. And there's some examples that they have in the essay of like the, the fundraising letter, as it were, where some of the merchants are sort of shaming the other ones along the lines of, you know, it would be unfortunate if the community learned that you're not willing to contribute to this project. So they're not threatening them with anything besides just telling the truth to people, but the idea being a, a shaming campaign to get some of these big merchants to kick in. All right, so again, just showing that's not something that's conventionally available in a mainstream mathematical model of the economy, where oh, you build a road and then you charge service, you know, unit prices for the use of the road, and da, 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 you know. All right, so um, also in this realm, sometimes people will say, oh, well, gee, everything would be discoordinated, and you know, maybe w as you went from one neighborhood to the other, all of a sudden red stoplights would mean go, and all that sort of thing. And you, know, you notice that you know, there's nobody in charge of the English language, right? And, it, and it's not that um, stop, you know, S-T-O-P means go in some states and not in others. You see what I'm saying? Like everybody, they have standards and, and things like that, even in, in terms of like screwdrivers fitting screws, you ever, ever think about that? Like, there's not a government agency in charge of saying, make sure that the screwdriver head fits into the screw. That's something that businesses have figured out standards, all right? And so likewise, it's not gonna be profitable if when your customers go from your roads onto your competitors' roads, all of a sudden there's a bunch of fatalities, right? That, that's not good for business besides other reasons. But what you, you do want, though, is you do want experimentation. So it's, it's wrong to think that, oh, only if one agency is in charge of all the roads, that they're, then we're gonna have public safety maximized. That, that's incorrect. You want there to be some experimentation because maybe right now the way people make roads is inadequate. And so the, the best thing I can do to get you to see that is when you get a chance, go to YouTube and look up Hans Mondermann. All right, you can see the spelling here. And so he was a road engineer and there's this amazing video. So his, the background on this guy, his view is when you're building a road, if you have to put up a sign that gives information to the drivers, then that's an admission of failure. That's showing that your road is not properly designed if you have to sort of cheat and give you know, exposition to the drivers in terms of, of signage. 
And he's, so he wants to design roads that by their very nature keep drivers alert and minimize accidents. And so there was one where you know, he, he designed this traffic circle. So when you're driving and you approach the traffic circle, it's very disorienting. But that's good because you don't want the drivers fiddling with the radio or you know, texting. You want them looking at the road and, whoa, what's going on? And what's your immediate instinct when you're approaching this traffic circle is you slow down. And he's saying that's what you want people to do. And so he had this great demonstration. There's a, you know, a camera crew doing a story on his road designs. And so he approaches you know, this real busy intersection or, or traffic circle, I should say. Cars weaving in and out. And then he's talking to the film crew and he turns around backwards to you know, walk into the traffic circle that he designed. So he died, but <laughs> I think we should applaud. No, he was fine. So, <laughs> so what? All right, but what, what happened though is, so it was, it was you know, risky, like cars were honking at him and swearing at him, but they didn't hit him because the point was he knew the, the road, he had designed it in such a way that when you're driving, that thing is a magnet for your eyes. Like you can't be looking away because it's so disorienting. And he's, he's, his point was that that's what you want. You don't want drivers getting lulled into a, you know, how like American drivers are on the interstate where you kind of, you know, good doze out. I mean, it's, I, I have heard a radio host one time say he watches movies on interstates. Like he puts the laptop in the, the footwell of his car <laughs> for real. And, you know, and I could, you know, it sounds nutty, but you could kind of see how someone might do that. He's, oh, I just glance down every once in a while and, you know, you're a long stretch. But the point being, that's not what you want people to do, at least if occasionally there is cross traffic, because then it lulls people into a, you know, they doze off. All right. So that's, that's the idea. So we don't really know what the optimal road design is. And I think sometimes people fall into the trap of assuming the way the government does it is correct. And how would a bunch of private businesses mimic exactly what the government's outcome is? No, we don't want the government outcome. The government outcome is bad. There's, not only are there more potholes than there should be, like that's pretty a standard critique of government. Oh, these, these roads are terrible. And that's true. But it's also the design. And so the, like intersections where that are, are referred to as death traps, okay? That there's intersections where a lot of people die every year. And in a, in a market where the roads were privately owned, I think the company would have much more incentive to deal with that and to figure out why is it that people keep getting in deadly accidents at this intersection and they would do something about it. It's not that the government road engineers want everybody to die. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying the incentives in place and the, how the system responds to that sort of information, if you will, and counteracts it or deals with it is much more sluggish when it's a government monopoly that, you know, it's not that the mayor is going to be, not be reelected because one intersection has a lot of fatalities because first of all, the people in that town or that community don't view it as a government failure. They view it as, oh, wow, that guy shouldn't have been running the red light or gee, that person shouldn't have been drinking before he got behind the wheel. They don't blame the design of the roads. All right. And so this is a point that Walter Block makes a lot that he said, if, if private business, and he you know, compiles the statistics about how many thousands upon thousands of people die every year in road tra traffic accidents. And Walter's point is that if a private business had that kind of record under its belt, there would be congressional investigations, right? There'd be all sorts of regulation into this crazy industry where you know, it's profits over people and you know, they don't care about consumer safety. But since it's the government designing it, people just assume, well, that's the way the world is because everyone knows the government has to run the roads. Also, um, this isn't so much a big deal in smaller towns, but when it comes to large cities, there are systematic, predictable traffic jams, you know, at least twice a day in the, the morning rush when people are going to work and then rush, so-called rush hour when they're going home. And depending on the city, I mean, it might be that many of the roads are just unusable for all practical purposes you know, for four hours a day. And you just know it's going to be a, a parking lot would you know, be the ironic phrase people would use to show how slowly you move through. And so that right there, that's not just up. Oh, that's a feature of roads. And that's how modern life works. No, that's government owned roads, a traffic jam. Just think about it. It's a shortage. It's showing that the quantity demanded of the available roads surface per unit time or however you want to quantify what the good is or the service is, is the quantity demand that exceeds the quantity supplied at that particular moment. And that's why you get a, a you know, jam pack full of people trying to squeeze in there. And so it, if the roads were privately owned, the immediate change would be they would raise the prices, at least for those hours or those um, times of operation. And that would speed up the flow. But then because there's open entry, if this were a private you know, free society where all the real estate's privately owned, then 
if you're seeing these abnormally high profits from the people who own the few bridges and, and roads and so forth, they would build more. Okay, so it's in the long run, all that would be returned to the consumer and things would be cheaper, but the immediate short term necessity, if every morning there's way too many people trying to use a bridge or a road to get downtown to go to work, the immediate thing that has to happen is the price of that shoots way up. And that's like a signal, if you will, to say, hey, build more roads. Uh, other things too here, it's not, I mean, the stuff I'm talking about is real plain vanilla economist stuff, but it's also more sinister in terms of, you know, if you view the state not as a bunch of well-meaning but bumbling folks who don't understand Econ 101, if instead you view the state as a gang of thieves writ large, well, then you really don't want the roads in the hands of that institution, right? And the, you see examples of the stuff. So Bridgegate, if you, in case you don't know what that is, so Chris Christie, um, when he was governor in his administration, um, there was a scandal and some of his operatives allegedly, or I think maybe they might have admitted it now, um, shut down a, a certain bridge lane of traffic just to cause traffic jams, to cause problems for the, the governor's political enemies. All right, and the, pro the, the scandal was that somebody, I think, was, was sick in an, in an ambulance and couldn't get across it because there was this big traffic jam that they deliberately caused just for political reasons. Okay, and so you, that's the kind of thing we're talking about where normally when you're debating the, the merits of government versus private ownership of the roads, most people don't say, oh, and a reason you wouldn't want to have a governor have any influence is in case he's mad at someone else, he might have his lieutenants intentionally cause a traffic jam just to spite that person. Right, that, that would, you wouldn't even think of something like that, and yet that really did happen. Also, um, asset forfeitures, as, as this is becoming a, a pretty um, noticeable problem now where more and more people are realizing it, where the police will pull a car over and do a search, and if there's a bunch of cash in the trunk, they assume you're a drug dealer and take your money, and you have to prove you're not a drug dealer in order to get your money back. And you know, it might take months, if ever, to get your money back where you have to prove you're not guilty of something. Right? Again, the reason that's such an issue is because the governments control the roads. If it were privately owned and the, and the owners of the roads could set their rules, obviously it wouldn't, they, it wouldn't be good for business to become well known. Oh yeah, don't ever drive down that particular, you know, the Acme Highway because the employees of Acme that I guess you signed a contract implicitly when you first started using the roads, pull you over and take stuff out of your car and then there's a whole process to get your stuff back. If any company had that policy, everybody would stop using that particular company's roads, all right? And so you can see how that sort of thing um, would be minimized if you had competition among the roads. And the last thing I got here is involuntary blood draws. Again, agents of the state have checkpoints. They pull people over. And there, there's cases where the, you know, the police will have a, a, a medic or somebody there and say, okay, take some of this guy's blood because we think you know, he's, he's been drinking too much and the person refuses, you know, doesn't consent to it, says, no, I want a lawyer, I'm not doing this. And it's an awkward situation where like, the medical personnel are being ordered by the police to, you know, and I know some people that just told the police, no, we're not doing it. If you want to take their blood, go ahead, but you know, this, this patient is not consenting to this medical procedure, so I'm not doing it. So I'm just saying, this kind of thing comes up, and again, why is that even an issue? It's because the, the government controls the roads right now, and that's a you know, choke point for a lot of transportation. Okay, so continuing in this vein of transportation, uh, imagine if airplanes or movie theaters ran their businesses the way that buses and subways work. It would look like that, all right? And so, again, if you haven't been in a big city, this might not really ring true to you, but for those of you who have been, and like you try to take the subway home from work at 5.30 p.m. in a major city, and it's like people really crush in to take up every available square centimeter of uh, surface area in the place, okay? And so that's, again, if, if a movie comes out, a blockbuster movie, and it's all sold out, once you get into the theater, you have a nice comfortable seat. It's not that the movie theater sells five times as many tickets, and so people are sitting on your lap and are scrunched into the theater and you can't even see, and yet that's how so-called public transportation works, okay? So again, just look at the different incentives and just think through why is that? So it's, again, it's not an issue of, oh, well, the demand's too high, and that's why there's, a, there's crunching in the subways, because when there's a blockbuster movie that comes out, the demand is high also. Or if people want to fly somewhere, you might get on the plane and say, wow, they sold every seat. This is a popular flight, and you're grumbling that you're you know, sitting in between two people and their, you know, maybe their arms are on your armrest, but that's night and day compared to what happens in so-called public um, transportation. 
All right, free and compulsory schooling. Government schools are a euphemism for prison in some communities. And uh, that's not funny. <laughs> it's a tragedy. Um, and it's, but, but in all seriousness, I mean, just comp compelling children to go to school. And again, it, the, some people say, oh, this is a conspiracy theory. Uh, I like Tom Woods' analogy on this one. He said, imagine like if, if Walmart ran the schools or people sent their, you know, their kids to a school that was run by Walmart, and they spent a lot of time in the history classes just you know, holding up pictures of Wal the, the founders of Walmart and you know, the inner family and the major shareholders, and look at how great their accomplishments were. And then in 1994, we had this initiative with our paper bags, and, da -da -da, you know, <laughs> and, and you, you, you can imagine you know, how people would deride this, oh, give me a break, this is all propaganda, yet when kids learn about the founding fathers and the wonders of America, and then Abraham Lincoln did this, and FDR did that, in government schools, that's just, oh yeah, that's our history, right? And so that, that's uh, also too, I've, again, I'm speaking more to an American audience here, so I apologize for those who are from other uh, countries, but from the US perspective, it's like Americans understand and believe that government schools indoctrinate children in every country except the United States. This is the one area where, no, no, they're, they're, they're getting the unvarnished truth. Okay, and so, it, and as more and more people realize that homeschooling and other non-traditional approaches outperform typical establishment ones, you know, you can look at test scores and stuff like that. Okay, uh, also on this, just imagine, if, it's hard for me to get regular people to agree that way too many people are going and getting undergrad degrees, you know, then that, that's what I think that I, it's partly just a cultural thing where now everyone thinks, oh, you have to go to college or else you're wasting your life. And also there's obviously all sorts of government um, subsidies involved that help perpetuate that outcome. I have had more success though if I say to people, all right, what if they were gonna ramp up the subsidies and insist that everybody get a PhD or, or most people try to get a PhD and you really haven't fulfilled your life, you're wasting, you know, you're being lazy unless you go get a PhD. Imagine if that were the trend, you could see, you know, most people say, yeah, that would be crazy. Because what would happen, it would cost a lot of money There'd be a huge opportunity cost in the sense of people missing out on five, six more years of their potential work career by staying in school that much longer. And also, in order for this to be possible, getting a PhD in all these fields, they're going to have way more degrees granted now. The standards would have to come down, right? It, it couldn't possibly be that just by spending more money, a bunch of people can get PhDs in, in physics or chemistry, uh, you know, this, this, or the standards would have to drop. All right, so that you can see how that wouldn't be good there. So I'm saying, all right, you think just right now we're at the optimum level of formal education being received? And obviously, I think not. Okay, uh, safety regulation. Every time there's a crisis, a foodborne illness or a plane crash, people will say, thank goodness we have the government agency that was in charge of not letting that happen. Right, and I'm not, I'm not putting words in their mouth. There was a plane crash when I was younger, it was a big deal. Uh, the, the company was called Value Jet at the time. They, they rebranded themselves after. And they, I think it was in the Florida Everglade, and they, they crashed, and it was a big thing. And someone wrote an op ed that we ran in my local newspaper that was you know, saying um, liber civil libertarians might complain about government funding, but after a plane crash, the rest of us are glad that the FAA has its people working overtime. And, and so, I, you know, and, that, and that's fine, but again, just think through what would have to happen for them to be upset with the FAA, right? Because there was a bad plane crash, and they, the investigations found that it wasn't like it was just a, a freak thing. It was that the, the, right, the safety inspectors weren't following the protocols that they were supposed to. All right, and so again, that was chalked up to, yep, that's the free market for you. When the FAA's inspectors don't do what they're supposed to do and there's a plane crash, there goes laissez-faire, right? It, so it's, it's just this weird thing. So maybe it is true that, oh, there's inadequate funding, but the point is, what, would, what could possibly happen to show you that the FAA is doing a bad job and we should consider an alternative approach, besides the fact that a plane still crashes on the FAA's watch? All right, so how could you get rid of that? You could have private insurance, right? So what if private insurance companies, what if what, when you bought a plane ticket, part of what you were buying was an indemnification clause saying if the plane crashes due to you know, things besides acts of God, then the insurance company owes the estate of the people who die in the crash a million dollars or whatever. So if, if that were the case, then the private insurance company's on the hook and they're not gonna agree to that 
unless they you know, know that the plane is following adequate safety protocols. So the insurance company then might send out you know, inspectors to check to make sure that the safety logs are up to date. They might give random sobriety or drug tests to the pilots just to make sure that the pilots aren't showing up drunk, that kind of stuff. So a lot of what the government conceivably could do in terms of regulation, you can see private watchdog groups doing that as well. And I, the, again, the, the big difference is the, the incentive structure. If some private agency, some insurance company is vouching for an airline and it's not doing a good job policing the pilots or the maintenance crew and there's a crash, the, the, I mean, the, the, the victims are the people who die in the crash, obviously, but also the, the insurance company now is going to be out several millions of dollars, okay? So they have an incentive to not find themselves in that position. Whereas, again, perversely, if there's a big plane crash, the people running the FAA can get more money from Congress because they can say we're understaffed, we need a bigger budget. It's true, maybe the higher-ups might have to resign just to you know, re remove this scandal, but the institution itself does not suffer when it doesn't do its job. It actually perversely gets more money. Okay, there's a similar thing with the FDA. I'll be real quick on this point. It's standard for a free market economist to complain about the FDA and say, that's the Food and Drug Administration, to say they have these unreasonably um, high levels of, of proof to jump through all these regulatory hoops to show like, um, you know, if you want to bring a, a new drug to market, you have to do all these tests and, and show clinical trials to show such and such. And so drugs that could be helping people are held off the market unnecessarily long. It raises the prices. By some estimates, it costs more than a billion dollars, billion with a B, to bring a new drug to market. And so you can see in that environment why there's only these blockbuster drugs that cater to something that's pretty popular as opposed to real niche products. And it just makes things really expensive. But they also commit the opposite error, where the FDA will approve something that really is dangerous in, in a meaningful sense, because everything isn't, you know, there's no such thing as a safe drug, all right? But the point when I say dangerous, I mean in the colloquial sense that if people knew the full risks, they wouldn't be taking it, and yet that gets approved. And go look up the Vioxx scandal if you want, and you'll see like how there was an, an insider who was saying that the FDA was you know, they approved it and they shouldn't have, and then it takes a while for them to admit their mistake, all right? And it sort of gives its blessing on something that it probably shouldn't have done so. Okay, what about vaccinations? This one to me is real simple, even though this is, this is a hot topic now. So remember, everything's privately owned in a, in a free society, and so every institution, every property owner can set the rules he or she wants. So like a, someone running a private school, if they want to, they can have the policy and say to the parents, hey, if you send your kid here, you got to agree to you know, these particular schedule of vaccinations as put out by the local pediatrics group, blah, blah, blah. And if not, you know, just take your business elsewhere. That's, you know, they, they have the right to do that. And if some schools want to you know, have, have a more open policy, they can do that. And so you let the market decide. So it's not that we need to come up with what's the libertarian answer to the vaccination question. It's just you, you leave it open and, and let um, institutions decide. What's funny here is I participated in a debate on this is that in some areas, you know, the case like when it comes to contagious diseases and things, a lot of times, you know, you can see why there'd be a prima facie case for coercion to be involved to set up a quarantine. And then, you know, it's, it's tricky to come up with, well, how would a free society handle that? But when it comes to just stuff like standard childhood vaccinations there, I mean, it, it is odd that prima facie, if a bunch of parents all do the right thing and vaccinate their kids, those kids should be somewhat protected from the unvaccinated kid, right? And so it, it's ironic that the, the people whose own kids receive the vaccination are often the ones really concerned about an unvaccinated kid playing with their kids when it's like, I thought the vaccine was supposed to keep your kids safe, right? So there's, there's that element. Now, the, what the response is, just to make sure you, you know it, the response from the people who think there should be coercion involved and the state has a role in forcing everyone to get vaccinated is they'll say, okay, well, there has to be this thing called herd immunity. And if a, if a sufficient fraction of the population is vaccinated, then you know, the, the disease or whatever can't get a, a foothold. But if we have too many that are unvaccinated, and at any given time, several people have to be unvaccinated because there are certain medical conditions you might have or really young children who aren't yet ready to be vaccinated or would be dangerous if they took the vaccine. So that's fine, but 
then notice now we're not saying the vaccine is safe or dangerous. The, the people who are pro coercive vaccination are admitting there are some people in the population who can't get vaccinated because it would be dangerous for them. And so now you're just disagreeing with parents over where the line is to be drawn. You're saying, no, no, we think it's safe for your kid. And the parent of that kid's saying, no, I don't. And that's what the argument's over. And so in general, the idea that we're gonna overrule what parents think is safe to put in their kids' bodies, I mean, that, that's pretty um, horrifying, I think. Okay, I got about two minutes here. Let me solve the immigration question in two minutes. You guys ready? <laughs> Hang on, all right. So as it was something like prayer in school, there's no good answer here, okay? That the people on both sides make compelling points. So when you're in a status framework, arguing over what the powerful, you know, institutional people running the, the state should do, everything's gonna be bad because it's involving the state, okay? What I would say though is, it, there's also though no such thing as a right to freely travel, which sometimes people talk about, I mean, that's, if you think about, the, no, in, in other settings that doesn't make sense. You can't just, the right to go anywhere you want people own things. So let me just show you what the first best solution looks like, and then you can try to figure out how to apply it in a, in a status setting. But in a free society, private landowners set whatever policies they want. So when it comes to something like the US-Mexican border, think of it like this, okay, where you see all the different landowners who all conveniently have very short first names. It worked out well. Okay, so last thing here, you guys ready for this? So. I'm saying people could set whatever policies they want, and so someone might be, well, what about Pam? What if Pam's crazy and she just lets, you know, Al-Qaeda throw parties in her backyard and they just come and go as they please? Ready, watch how the free society would deal with somebody like Pam who's letting these people cross the Mexican border too quickly. Boom, you see how that works? Okay, so you need to get outside of the mentality of just thinking, oh, crossing this one line between Mexico and the U.S. If, private, if each parcel of land is privately held, it would be this sort of situation. So if somebody had really liberal policies, well, their neighbors could then have more you know, stricter ones, and that would contain the problem if there really is a problem. Okay, so again, that's the first best solution, and then you can quibble about, okay, what do we do in the current environment? Okay, that's my time. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>